Yes. But um, anyway, that's, <laughs> we know better. that's the price we pay, right? Okay. Well, it's good to be with you all. We were here, um, it was much colder, I believe. It was yeah. January yeah. or February, yeah. yes. And um, you all were very receptive and warm, and it was great to be with you. And so it's great to be back with you all. And it's unbelievably beautifully warm. I just can't <laughs> even believe it. It's wonderful. It's just a great weekend for marriage retreat, marriage and conference. So it's... Um, it's so good to be with you all, and I'm so glad that the men have been able to go through the program. Um, I was, I'll tell you a little bit about myself, just really quickly. I was raised in a good, godly home. I was raised in a church just very similar to this in a downtown area. Um, we were land blocked. We only had like three parking spaces. My dad was the pastor. He started the church like 49 years ago, and just Two years ago, he turned it over to my brother-in-law, and so um, I, I understand that you know your, the the challenges that it is to, to have a city a church in the city. But anyway, we I was raised in a great godly home. Um, I married Dave, and we were older. I was 31 when we got married, and so we were we were I was single for a long time. But he has helped me with the truths. The truths that the men are learning are just victory truths. And all of us can benefit by victory truths. And it's just about living in victory. And he has helped me, even though I grew up in a fundamental independent Baptist church all my life, he has a way of teaching that has helped me. And I just thank God for a godly man. And I know we are, that's why we're, I'm not saying that because we're at a marriage retreat. I still struggle with the same things you do. But that... The teaching that he has put into this program has helped me personally. So it's actually not just for men, it's for everybody how to walk in victory. So I'm so glad that you all got to benefit by that. And um, so that's us. And I wanted to tell you about a couple of books from our table, our table up there. So when I got married, I, I was 31 and I had been serving God um, as a single girl ever since I graduated from college, so eight or nine years. So I was used to just going and serving God, you know what I mean? You just get in the car and you go and you don't come home till midnight and you fall asleep and you get up and do it over, all over again. So when I got married to somebody in the ministry, it's like, okay, that's what we do. And then I had a baby. I'm like, oh, a baby. And this baby isn't just portable, right? It's just, you just can't just go and be gone all day. And so it was actually very life-changing for me. And um, I want to show you about a couple of books that really helped me figure my way out, like figure how to do this. How do I serve God and have children? And then I realized, you know, Titus talks about we're supposed to be first wives, then mothers, then ministers to other people right. and ladies in the church. And it was very confusing to me at first because I was... At the first, when we got married, he was the assistant pastor, and I thought, I need to please everybody in the church, including his mother-in-law, I mean, my mother-in-law, his mother, which was the pastor's wife. I mean, that was hard. And, I, and, and uh, everybody wanted me to be the president of the ladies' circle, and I'm like, I just had a baby. I don't know if I can do that. I'm learning this motherhood thing, this wife. Anyway, I went to the Bible, and I just said, God, what am I supposed to do? You know? And, and just like Mrs. Jenkins said, didn't she do a good job? Yeah. She's, she's, she was a help because sometimes our husbands don't even have the answers for us. And we have to go to the Bible and find yes, the answers. Right. Because he was so busy being a, an assistant pastor and doing his business and you know serving the Lord for him. That he didn't know how to help me in that area. He had helped me in many other areas, but not in that area. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so I had to go to the Bible and say, this is what... When I'm, when I'm on my deathbed, I don't want it to be that I reached millions and, and lost my own, too. Yeah, right. And so God helped me by his mercy and grace to just realign my focus that, yes, I'm going to be involved. Of course I'm going to be involved. I can't be not involved. It's in my DNA to be involved. And I was very involved in music, very involved in Sunday school church, church Sunday school teaching, junior church. But my first and primary, primary was my husband and then my children. And it really helped me to go to the Bible and, and to find help. But the other book that helped me a lot was The Battle Within, and we sell this on our table, What Being a Mom Taught Me About Myself. And it's a very helpful book. 
And if we run out of, of them, um, we can maybe send some back. But it's just a very helpful book on the spirit-filled life. And we can say, oh, well, preachers have to be spirit-filled. Evangelists have to be spirit-filled. Do moms have to be spirit-filled? Do wives have to be spirit-filled? We can go through the motions. We can be super mom, and it lasts maybe for like a day, right? And then we crash and burn. Jesus had to help me. His Holy Spirit had to teach me not to be super mom, but to be spirit-controlled mom. And it's a, it's a lifelong lesson. I definitely have not arrived. If anybody has, let me know. But I, I think <laughs> so often that the Holy Spirit peels back layers of ourselves, and it's not pretty. It's not pretty. When he showed, he, when he showed me who I was, really, it was very not pretty. But as I repent and, and say, okay, God, change me. Help me to see what you want me to be. Um, he, he helps by his great mercy and great grace, like we talked about earlier. Unmerited favor. And, and our definition for grace is God's enabling power to do what he wants me to do. That's grace. I don't need grace to do what I want to do. I need grace to do what he wants to do. And he will give me enabling power to do what he wants me to do. What does God want you to do? He will give you the power to do it. And so we just have to find God's will and do it. But this was very helpful to me, if that can be helpful. Now, this, this lady who wrote this book is, um, my sister gave me a book one time when I first got married, and she wrote in the fly leaf, spit out the seeds. Do you know what that means? Mm -hmm. yes. So it means take the good, leave the bad, you know, and when you eat watermelon, you spit out the seeds. Most people don't chew them up and swallow them. This book was very helpful to me, created to be his helpmate. <coughs> uh, that, now, the author has different things to say sometimes, and we totally get that, I hope. I hope that we don't get like thrown out on the street. But she has really good things to say about the four different types of husbands. And um, we only have one copy of this, but you can maybe buy some on Amazon or, or contact us. But say your dad is one way, and you marry someone, and there's someone different. It almost takes like 20, 30 years to like get used to that new person. You know? You're like, what? You never on time? My dad was like militant being on time. And, and it's just like, okay, it's, it's okay. We'll, we'll get through this. And, and um, there's a book called, it's, it's, it's a worldly publisher, but I think it's I'm Okay, You're Okay. Yeah. It's like, you know what, we're, we're going to make it. He, he's not exactly like my dad or my grandfather, but we're, we're okay. We're going to make it if we stay in God's know, doing God's will and, and trusting in his power. But this book was a help to me. So those are my two books. But that's not even what I'm going to talk about today. So let's, um, let's pray and then we'll get into it. Dear Lord, thank you so much for these precious ladies that took their Saturday to be here. I pray that you will help us to learn something. And maybe we won't even learn anything. We already know so much, don't we, Lord? But help us to walk away with one thought from today. Pray for the Jenkins, which will give them safety as they travel to the airport. Help them to make their flights. I pray that you will give them um, a great day in your house tomorrow. Give us a good day in your house tomorrow. I pray that you'll be with the men, be with our husbands, Lord. We all need you desperately, and we, we just need your presence in our lives and in our marriages and our homes. So thank you for the wonderful time that we've had already, and I pray that you'll continue to work. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever thought about what you think about? <laughs> it sounds weird, but lately, the Lord has been teaching me to think about what I think about. And um, our thoughts are very, very powerful. And Mrs. Jenkins mentioned that this morning when she said your mind, she was talking about your mind and what you talk to yourself about. Um, in 2005, the National Science Foundation published an article regarding research about human thoughts per day. The average person get, has how many thoughts? 12,000 to 60,000 thoughts per day. Of those, 80% are negative and 95% are exactly the same repetitive thoughts as the day before. There's a book called, What Do I Say When I Talk to Myself? Have you ever listened to your thoughts for just one day, one hour, one minute? I dare you to try. You might be surprised as I was when I finally started listening to my thoughts, listening to the input I was giving myself 
day in and day out. We're going to look at the Bible here for a minute, but I forgot to tell you that I love the Costantinos, and we just met them, and we're so thankful for them, and their testimony, and their faithfulness, and, and they're just gifts. They're gifts. Yes. They really are. Yeah. And so I'm very thankful for them. And I also wanted to say thank you for the food and all of you who worked in the kitchen last night. And the decorations are so cute with the arrow. I think it's so adorable. And the love struck theme with the light up there. And the music last night, great. This has really, really been a great conference. I don't know if you know what we have here. This is great. This is really, really a blessing. Um, you know, when we, you're asked to speak at a conference, you don't know what it's going to be like. You know what I mean? You know, and so it's, I, I'm just really impressed. So I thank you. And not that I have to be impressed. It's all for Jesus, right? But just, I'm really thankful for all the investment of time and work. And I don't even know who to thank specifically about some things. But thank you very, very much. And we had a little basket, a bag of goodies, and we thank you for that. You all take really good care of, of your, your speakers, and I appreciate it very, very much. So um, we're going to think about what we think about. But before that... The marriage, there's a marriage poem that a lady wrote about her husband. And this is not funny. This is, you, might, you might actually cry because this is actually sweet. Okay? So get your tissues out. Uh, we laughed upstairs earlier, but when I, when I read this, I, I actually cried. So before we get into what we think about, let's think about our marriages and think about if you can relate to this. Marriage. It's like prose. It's not, it doesn't even rhyme. It's prose. It's rough, it's tough, it's work. Anybody who says it isn't has never been married. <laughs> Marriage is far, has far bigger problems than toothpaste squeezed from the middle of the tube. <laughs> that was funny, yeah. <laughs> it's not all funny. Marriage means aching, struggling, persevering. It means putting up with personality weaknesses, accepting criticism, and giving each other freedom to fail. It means sharing deep feelings about fear and rejection. It means turning self-pity into laughter and saying a prayer to gain control. Marriage means gentleness and joy, toughness and fortitude, fairness and forgiveness, and a walloping amount of sacrifice. Marriage means learning when to say nothing, when to keep talking, when to push a little, when to back off. It means acknowledging I can't be God to you because I need him too. Marriage means you are the other part of me and I am the other part of you. We'll work through with never a thought of walking up. Marriage means two imperfect mates building permanently, giving totally, in partnership with a perfect God. And she wrote to her husband, marriage, my love, means us. It's work. I'm not, I'm not going to say it isn't. It is work. But it's worth it. And do you know who hates your marriage? The yes. devil hates yes. your marriage. And do you know he works almost every day at dividing you with your husband? I know it's not just my marriage. He is, he is the author of confusion, he's the author of pain, he's the author of suffering, and he really comes to kill, destroy, St kill, steal, and destroy. Mm -hmm. But Jesus comes to bring life, and sometimes in our house, I just call on the name of Jesus, I'm not Pentecostal, but I just say, <laughs> Jesus, help us, because you know what? If you are serving God in any way, shape, or form, if you want your children to follow Jesus with their whole heart, you will be fighting with hell and his demons, and, and you have to resist them in the name of Jesus. And, and I, I'm not being weird, and I'm not call, you know, saying that there's a devil behind every bush. I'm not saying that. But when we follow Jesus, we have to have fortitude. We have to have courage, and we have to call on Jesus day in and day out. We have to be women of faith. We have to be women of prayer, and we have to resist the enemy in our lives and in our homes. So this poem just really, really spoke to me, and I wanted to share that with you. But um, marriage is a beautiful thing, but anything that's beautiful, as we know, takes work. So back to our thoughts. How we think, day in and day out. So have you ever thought about what you think about? <laughs> so this, we have three points, three main points, three things that we think about. 
I didn't. I don't have a, a handout, but if you want to write it in your in your conference notebook, that's fine. There are three main um, topics that we think about every day, probably every single day that we think about that will influence us, our marriage, our family, and beyond. Proverbs 23, 7a, it says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So, as a woman thinks in her heart, so is she. We are what we think. There is a direct link that connects our thoughts to our actions. One author wrote, be careful of your thoughts. They may break into words at any time. Is that not true? Proverbs 12, 5a. The thoughts of the righteous are right. Is that a cool verse? The thoughts of the righteous are right. So we all have people that we respect and we admire. Do you have anybody that you respect and you admire and you're like, how do they do what they do? If you followed them around for a day, I think you would find that their thoughts are right. Okay? Their thoughts are right. They're thinking right. We all have choices about what we think. We can all choose to think negatively. We can all choose to think angrily. We can all choose to think critically. The thoughts of the righteous are right. Can you say that with me? I know that's weird, but I didn't even plan to say that. But let's say that together. The thoughts of the righteous are right. So we have to say, how do some people seem to just go always do the right thing? And it seems they kind of go through life without a lot of drama. What's the secret? Are they just wired differently than we are? Maybe they just have a different personality. They're more laid back. Well, I think if we crawled inside their heads, we would find they're thinking correctly. Are we thinking correctly this morning? There are three vital subjects when it comes to our thinking. First of all, let me share with you A.W. Tozer. Have you ever heard of him? No. A.W. Tozer, he said this, What comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. So, according to A.W. Tozer, the most important thing about us is nothing that can be seen outside, not physically, not our car, not our house, not, you know, our jewelry, our accessories. The most important thing about you and the most important thing about me is what comes into my mind when I think about God. So let me ask us this morning, what do you think about God? Every single one of us has an image of God in our minds. So often he is either a loving, kind, do what you want, whatever feels good, do it kind of God, or... In your, another person's mind, he is a judge ready to throw down the gavel anytime we sin. And in some respects, both are right. Am I right? And oftentimes, who our earthly father is will reflect what we think of, of our heavenly father. So if your earthly father was this way, you might think of God as being that way. If he were this way, you might think of God as that way. But we need to say, what does the Bible say about God? And that's what I'm going to think about God. We have to have a foundation, right? Our foundation cannot be what I think, feel. It has to be built on the Word of God. That's why we're going to use Bible verses this morning. It's not just a TED Talk. You guys ever hear of TED Talks, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just, you know, we're just going to tell you what I, what I think and what I've learned in my psychology classes. It's what does the Bible say, and then we build our lives on the Bible. And Jesus has, he, when he came to this earth, he was a picture of God in the flesh. So when you see Jesus, you see what God is like. But here are some verses on what God is like. Psalm 100, verse 5. For the Lord is good. Let's say that together. For the Lord is good. Do you think God is good? 1 John 4, 8 goes on to tell us, God is love. Do you really think God is love? Now we know the right answer. God is love. Yes, teacher, I, I, you know, in, in Sunday school. But do you think God is love in your life? Think about your life. If you're 40, 40 years, 20, 20 years, 80, 80 years, has God been loving to you? Do you truly believe that he is up to something good in your life? In James, he says God is the giver of good gifts. Good gifts. So everything good in your life this far has been given to you by God. 
Do you think about God like that? At the same time, because he knows that wrong choices will ultimately hurt us so very much, he warns us to stay away from sin, just like a good daddy would. Those Ten Commandments, they're not there to hurt us. They're there to help us. You say, oh, I, I don't like following those Ten Commandments. Uh, you know, in, in Psalm it says, you know, thy precepts are like honey and I did eat them. And, oh, I love thy commandments and thy testimonies. And, I, and when I was a girl, I honestly thought, I don't like the Ten Commandments. I just want to do what I want to do. A teenager, you want to do what you want to do. Right? Feelings are pretty strong. As I got older, I say, you know what? Yeah. His commandments and his testimonies are like the guardrails of my life to keep me on his happy pathway. And, and even if we're in church our whole lives, sometimes we don't think of it that way. We think, oh, this is, I have to stay rigid in the path, stay on the path. And it's like, no, it's a happy, good path. Now, it's not always happy, I shouldn't say that. It's a joyful, good path. There's always the deep-seated joy when you put your head on the pillow at night that you did the right thing. It might not be, whoop, doo -doo 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 -doo, flare and confetti and all that fun stuff. Sometimes it's work and you have to have fortitude like we talked about. But there's joy in serving Jesus, deep-seated joy in serving Jesus, deep-seated joy in following his commandments and saying, okay, God, I chose this one man and I'm going to keep choosing this one man. Yes, I could do what every other girl in America is doing. I could and you could, right? Next year this time, any one of us could not we could be a story in the headlines of independent fundamental Baptist churches. Every single one of us. It's only God's grace. It's only God's grace that says, I will follow you. I will stay close to your word. I will love you and I will love your word. Day in and day out. Is it hard? Yes. It's how we're thinking though. We say, Jesus, it's the, the way of the transgressors is hard. We think our life is hard. Imagine what happens when you don't follow the commandments. The lies, and then the lies to cover up the lies. I mean, I, I have I've done enough things in my life, especially as a teenager, um, you know, where you're like sneaky, and then you have to cover up the sneakiness. That's, I, I can't say that was the most thrilling thing of my life. It, I mean, it's fun for a moment, we know that. But the, the covering up is not fun. It's awful, actually. And then having to confess and, and, and to your parents and be like, God, oh, Mama, I did this. It's not fun. So don't do it. Just don't even go there. In your mind, don't go there. Ladies, we can really have a world in our minds. It's called fantasy. And it can be developed at a very young age. It can be developed about 11, 12, according to, um, to scholars. And we have to rein it in constantly. It's kind of like a wild animal. And we have to rein it in and say, no, 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 I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to think about if I married that person or if I went to that church or if I didn't even. No, 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 no. Rein it in and say, Jesus, by your power, help me to think right. So think right about God. What are some ways we can think about God? What are some names for God? When we think about God, what names come to mind? Yes? Yahweh. Yahweh? Anybody else? Yes? Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh. I think, yes? Daddy. Daddy. Isn't that a great word, daddy? And some of you may have had, I'll talk about this in a little bit, a daddy that you can run up on his lap and hug him. My daddy wasn't like that. So I had to learn that my God can be that way. My daddy is awesome. My daddy. I can run to Jesus at any time. I think of Jesus I, and God, I think of rock. He's my rock. Can your emotions ever go up and down? He's my rock. He's my high tower. He's my fortress. He's my strong one. These are all biblical words for God. He's also my comforter. On those days when nobody else gets it. He's my prince of peace. One day I was shopping and I stumbled into a Christian bookstore. It's closed now. Now we just have to buy books online, it seems like. I don't, I don't see a lot of Christian bookstores. But there was a, a title that jumped out at me. It was, the title of this book was The God Who Smiles. The God Who Smiles. To think of that, a smiling God. 
So I, I alluded to my dad, who he was more militant. Awesome dad, started our church, raised six, and then adopted a seventh child. Great man. Up every morning at 5.45, sitting in the green chair in the living room, reading his Bible by like 6.15. Devotions, family devotions at 7.05, we had like a shower schedule. We each had like five minutes. So we had to sign up the night before because we had one bathroom with six kids. And we each got like five minutes. And at one point we were even setting timers for how long the water could be on. God bless his dear heart. But it, 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 that's what you have to do, right? You have to pay the bills. You have to keep these kids clothed. And um, so he was very militant. I mean, we even had room check for a season. So we'd come down and we would do room check. And I'm like, oh, no, what's he going to find? You know, and um, Bible schedules, we had to, we had Bible reading schedules. And we had to read through the Bible in a year. I'm like, okay, all right, I can do this. And so you get a little bit behind, and then you're like, oh, no. And then you get way behind. And then he's like, okay, tomorrow's going to be Bible reading schedule time. We're going to check your Bible reading schedules. <laughs> so I'm like, oh no. So I sheepishly showed him, because there was no way I could get cut off that night before. I sheepishly showed him, he's like, okay, you can, you can go to the porch and finish reading your Bible. I'm like, oh, okay, Dad. <laughs> so I went to the porch and I finished reading my Bible. I mean, it wasn't tons. It probably took me like an hour. But so that might not be the way to be, but he did his very best, you know? And he was a first-generation Christian. And he wanted to raise his children for the Lord. And we all love Jesus. Praise God. And we are protected. Praise God. God protected us in that church. We weren't inner city. We were not inner city Boston. But we were surrounded by people. And my dad had a huge heart for people. So we had a lot of, um, at seasons, a lot of needy people in our church. And God protected us. You know, from, in, from people that could have taken advantage of us. So my dad was very militant. So he didn't really smile a lot. And I have to work on it too. My, I, I tend to, the corners of my mouth tend to droop. And one time I looked at my mom during church and she was going, <laughs> <laughs> what is my mom doing? And later she told me, she's like, I have to work at, at having a pleasant look on my face. And I'm like, oh. And as I get older, I realize I have to work and have some pleasant look on my face. So I practice. I actually do practice. Isn't that funny? I practice having a pleasant look because I can look very stern and I'm just being, I'm just normal. I'm not mad or anything. I just am stern looking. Well, that was my dad. So my dad would walk into a room. You know, we had a Christian school, and if he ever came into the learning center where we had school, it was like, oh, no. You know what I mean? You always thought you were going to get in trouble. Literally, always thought you were going to get in trouble. But that was just my dad, and that's how he was. So to find this book, The God Who Smiles, it just, I, I bought it. It was a cute cover, it was on sale, and I just bought it. And I still have it, and whenever I see it, it hugs me on the inside. The God Who Smiles. God can smile and delight in us. You know what, Zephaniah is a book in the Bible. Believe it or not, Zephaniah, who's ever thought of it and heard of Zephaniah? We never preach from Zephaniah. Zephaniah 3.17, you know what it says? The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will joy over thee with singing. What do you think of God? Do you think of him as smiling? Is he good? Is he a good God? Is he trustworthy? I remember going through a tough time. As I said, I was single for a while, waiting for my Prince Charming to come sweep me off, you know, into the sunset. And... <laughs> I was driving to work one day and I listened to a message on the radio and the preacher on the radio was saying, now I know you can't listen to everything on the radio, believe me, but this preacher was saying something so good. He said, tell God, I choose to trust you, I refuse to doubt you. I choose to trust you, I refuse to doubt you. So that comes to our, our brain. What are we going to do in those moments when something hard happens? When those financial struggles come, when your kids are absolutely haywire and your husband is nowhere to be found, when big life circumstances happen, death, cancer, can't pay the mortgage, even just chronic health conditions when you don't know what is going on with this person and I don't know how to help them or help me and you need answers, 
In this moment, God, I choose to trust you. I refuse to doubt you. It helped me so much. We have to make sure and decide in our thoughts. It really does start here, I promise you. In your thoughts, as we wash the dishes, as we go to work, as we do laundry, every step of the way, we're thinking something. It's really amazing when you start to think about it. Start to think about it. Anyway, but you see, <laughs> I will choose to trust you, God. Get a verse, claim it, say it back to him, cling to him and his word. You will never, ever, 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 ever regret trusting God and his word. You will never regret trusting God and his word, ever. You say, oh, but the compulsion is so strong to follow my heart. There's a guy at work and he looks at me and we get this connection, he and me. Do you know that we will, get, you know, we will have people that you connect with, but you're not to marry them. Right? right? You are married to that one man till death do us part. There are connections with people sometimes. And you have to say, you have to tell yourself over and over and over that he is not for me. I found the one who my soul loves. I found the one for me. And you, you continue to think about, we'll talk about this later, but you think about all the good things that you love about that man when you first met him. And you write them down and you dwell on them, you dwell on them, and you dwell on them. You don't think about that connection with that guy. Online, I would never be in a social chat room. You could never find me in a social chat room, ever. I wouldn't even, I don't even know how to access it and I never want to. Don't go there. Sure. Don't go there. Keep God big in your mind. Keep God awesome in your mind and you don't even desire that. Keep God big. What do you think about God? So that was the first question. The second question is what do I think about myself? What do I think about God? What do I think about myself? You say, oh, we're not supposed to think about ourselves. Did I hold that the right way? I think this is the better way. <laughs> what do I think about myself? We are ladies, and we do have days of being insecure, right? Some days more than others. Some days we may feel like nobody struggles like you do. And we do. We all have individual struggles. And maybe, you know, the ladies in your church, they don't struggle like you do in that area. But they do have struggles. They do, I promise you. Every person has struggles. And they may act like they don't, and everything's perfect. They have struggles. Or maybe you feel you're not good enough. I just don't measure up. We live in a Pinterest perfect world. I don't see people posting their worst moments on Instagram, although there are some. There are some. I do see some. But most are sharing the highlights of their life, not the lowlights. Sometimes we can start analyzing our life, my life, through their life. Whoa, I didn't get a new car this year. Whoa, how do they get so many amazing clothes? Like every time they post a picture, they have a different outfit on. Or their house is decorated so beautifully, their carpet is so posh. Look at their shingles are better than my shingles. Seriously, people are getting new houses all the time, and you're just like, that, that is not what God wants us to be doing as ladies of the word. It's not. And you say, well, they're not bad, and they're not. I'm not saying that they're bad. But if you want to be rooted and grounded in truth, if you want to think right, if you want your children to be godly children, if you want to be on your deathbed saying, thank you, God, for helping me live my life for you and impact other people, we have to say, what do I think about myself through the Bible? What does God say about me? And I'm going to think how God thinks about me. Our significance comes from the creator of the universe. Think about that. Your significance comes from the creator of the universe. Self-condemnation, however, comes from our flesh and the father of lies. Our identity, what we think about ourselves, must be based on the truth of God's word. You say, well, I'm not good enough. You're right, neither am I. I'm just not. But according to the Bible, you are very special. And if you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, that's who Jesus sees. Because we are formed in the image, in the likeness of God, we are invaluable to him. He treasures you. Can you say, he treasures me? He treasures me. Carrie Lodge says this, he made us each unique, individual, one of a kind. No one has ever or will ever walk the earth who is exactly the same as us. 
We are his masterpieces, made in his image, and called to live out our God-given identity as his daughters. The Bible tells us time and time again that we are priceless to him. Jenny Allen, she comments on three passages in the Bible. Okay, so quickly, three passages in the Bible. These verses remind us to think truth about ourselves. Let's start in the beginning. Let's start in the very beginning, right? Genesis, the very first book of the Bible. Genesis 1, verse 27. Genesis 1, 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, and here comes our part, male and female created he them. Human beings were created in the image of God to reflect the image of God. Oftentimes, maybe when your babies were born or someone you, you know, oftentimes when a baby is born, they'll say, oh, he looks just like you. You're like, yeah. Or, boy, he looks like his dad, yeah. Or he looks like Aunt Gertrude on your, um, you know, your dad's uncle's side. You're like, what? Okay. <laughs> All right. But however it may be, we do think it's neat when babies reflect family members. It's neat. Do you reflect God? We do. We do reflect God. Now, we don't understand all of it. But in a similar way as a baby reflecting or, or imaging her parents, we, we reflect him. We are made in his image. Our intellect, in some way, is made in the image of God. We're, it's pretty amazing what a human being can do with our brains, right? And how many things we can remember. We have been given special talents and abilities that are from him. Now, let's go to Ephesians 2, verse 10. Ephesians 2, verse 10. It says, we have been created with a purpose. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You have been created with a purpose. Maybe some of you are great at decorating. Maybe some of you are great at making cakes. Maybe you're musically inclined, or you're great with organizing and administration. All of these gifts are from God. You are special to him. He has created good works for you to do. Psalm 139, our, our third verse that we'll look at. Psalm 139, two verses, 13 and 14. Psalm 139, 13 and 14. We use these verses a lot um, in, in, in the agenda for pro-life. For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and what? Wonderfully. Wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. You are marvelously made, and that my soul knoweth right well. I am the wonderful creation. You are the wonderful creation of a loving God. He knows everything about us, and guess what? He still loves us. Wow. So first, what do I think about God? Second, what do I think about myself? And lastly, what do I think about my spouse sitting upstairs? Yes, that's right. We're at a marriage conference, right? What do I think about my husband? Proverbs 14.1. Have you ever heard this verse? Every wise woman buildeth her house, but what do the foolish do? Pluck it down with their hands. Is this talking about buying two by fours and literally building your house? No, we're building up the lives, the emotions. Of the, of the people we live with, and more specifically, the man we chose to spend forever with, till death do us part. We need to build our homes by first and foremost investing in our relationship with our husband, and going to a conference is great, but it takes day to day. You say, I'm, I'm not in the mood to talk, don't talk, don't talk, I'm gonna go to sleep. And once in a while that happens, right? But communication on a day to day basis, Building that relationship, building, building, building. Now, when I think of building, I think of encouraging, and I think of edifying. Do you know what the word encourage means? Encourage, two parts, encourage. It actually means to fill with courage. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> Jumping. Um, your husband is a man and he lives in 2022, and he needs courage to do right. And he needs courage to make strong decisions and follow God with his whole heart. Do I help? I hope I do. 
Let's help our husbands. Let's encourage them. What do I think when I think about my husband? Do I think of ways to encourage him? Do I text him notes of encouragement? Do I verbally praise his accomplishments? Or I say, no, 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 no. He's good at that, but I'm not going to tell him he'll get a big head. Oh, dear sister, please tell him. If he does something well, tell him. Please tell him. Verbalize it to him. He needs to hear it. Well, fill him with courage. When you give him encouragement, you are telling him, I think a lot about you. I value you. How about when he makes hard calls for the spiritual life of your family? It's not fun, right? Sometimes they'll come home from a conference and they'll say, I was convicted about da 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 da. And you hold on. I hope you do. I hope you, t I hope you pray, or else there could be explosives, right? <laughs> and you just say, oh, Lord, please help me. I, have you ever been there? Where you just start praying right away, whenever they start the conversation? And, and this is what I feel God wants us to do. And you're thinking, oh, my friends are going to think that's crazy. Nobody else in our church does that. Nobody else on Pinterest does that. <laughs> of course they don't, right? <laughs> You say, that's weird. That's really weird. I can't do it. There's no way I can do it. I would die if we did that. He's the leader of our home. He's the leader of your spiritual life, actually. He, you are in charge, obviously, of your spiritual life, but he is responsible for the health of the home. He is responsible for your home. He will stand before God for every single person in that home. It's a huge, really, really weighty responsibility, actually. I am so glad, as hard as we have to work as ladies with laundry and cooking and thinking of all the meals, I mean, why, who has to eat three times a day, right? <laughs> Eating is so overrated. <laughs> Seriously, in clothes, why do we have to have clothes? No, just kidding. But, um, sorry. <laughs> take that out and you record it. Clothes are very, very important. And, um, but it's, it's like it's all on us, right? Yeah. Do you ever feel that way? It's like, it's all on me. Yeah. I do this, I do that, I do this. And then I have to remind myself, he carries the weight of the big decisions. He carries the weight of the spiritual decisions in our home. Help him. Encourage him. Tell him, that will be hard, but I'm glad you're leading, and I'll do everything I can to help you. This will encourage him. We'll fill him with courage. Sometimes we can think about how much we just wish he would help, how much he, we wish he would pick up after himself. Our thoughts can so easily tear down the most important person to us. And sometimes, you know what? I say, dear God, help me to want to encourage my husband. When I was a teenager, you know what I would pray? Help me to want to be pure. And God answered that prayer. He is so good. God is so good. He, I didn't, I, say, I would say, I don't want to, I want to be bad, please help me to want to do right. Sometimes our want to's are broken. Sometimes we get tired, we get worn out, and we don't want to anybody anymore. And you say, dear Lord, help me to want to love this man, encourage him, help me to want to. Help me to think right. We'll get back to that in a minute. So that's the first way, encourage him. The second way, this is hard. I might step on some toes, but this is huge for me, and I work on it every single day of my entire married life. We just celebrated only 15 years. Some of you have been married 15 years, 51, 27, 28. 15 years. I've worked on it probably every single day of my 15 years. Okay? Ephesians 5.33. Anybody know? And maybe for you it's not a problem. Ephesians 5.33 says, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself. Well, that's their responsibility upstairs to talk about that. We're talking about the second part. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. I printed off that last phrase, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. This is Bible just as much as, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, Bible. This is Bible just as much as John 3.16, Bible. This is Bible just as much as in the beginning God created Adam and Eve Bible. And I, I need help with this. The wife see that she reverence her husband. We say, honey, I love you. But what does love look like from a guy's view? A survey was done at a marriage retreat like this. 
The men were placed on one side of the room and the women were placed on the other side. And the speaker said, I'm going to ask you to choose, get this, choose between two bad things. The speaker went on, men, women, would you rather feel alone and unloved in the world or would you rather feel inadequate and disrespected by everyone? Alone and unloved or inadequate and disrespected by everyone? That'd be hard, right? So the speaker then turned to the men's side of the room. Okay, men, who here would like to feel alone and unloved? A sea of hands went up. And a giant gasp rippled across the woman's side of the room. Then it was the ladies' turn to answer, and the men's turn to be shocked, when most of the women indicated that they'd rather feel inadequate and disrespected than unloved. So we have a deep need to be loved. If a man, though, feels disrespect, he's going to feel unloved. That's right. What does this even mean? Respect, reverence. Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary says, in the verb form, right, because it's a verb. It's saying, you see that you reverence. It's an action. Reverence. It's an action. It's not just this noun, reverence. It's an action. <laughs> verb is, reverence is to regard with fear. Fear, that's not the scary fear, that's the in awe fear. I get to live with this man. That's an honor. Yeah. Not everybody gets married. I get to be married. And I he chose me. Out of all the girls in the world he could have chosen, he chose me. Fear mingled with respect and affection. The Merriam Webster dictionary says the verb reverence means to honor and admire profoundly and respectfully. Now, do I reverence my thought, my, do I reverence my husband and my thoughts? If I do, guess how it will come out? It will come out in my tone. This was very, very helpful to me when I learned this. Every one of us comes from a different home. You were raised differently than I was. I was you know, we're all raised differently. Our moms had strengths, they had weaknesses. Okay, I did not get this tone thing down, and I, I'm still working on it, the tone. Do you know what I mean by tone? Yeah. Yeah. So you could say this one of two ways. Whatever you decide will be fine. <laughs> Whatever you decide will be fine. <laughs> My tone says it all. And you say, well, I, I just said that, you know, it would be nice if you would pick up your socks. And he'll be like, that is not how you said it. <laughs> and in my mind, that kind of is how I said it. But then I have to say, okay, how did I say it? And will he tell you? Oh, yes, he'll tell you. <laughs> he'll tell you exactly how you said it. And my husband, unfortunately, is very accurate. He really is. He has a very accurate remembrance of everything. And I'll, and I'll be like, oh, 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 oh. I say, I'm sorry, a lot. But he does too. It takes two. And win, win, win. Tone. Our tone makes all the difference. What about the time Thanksgiving's coming? Our husband forgets that he's supposed to carve the turkey. And he's watching football again, like we saw last night in the skit. Okay, so we can be seething in the kitchen, right? Mm -hmm. Seething. I mean, literally, everybody knows, don't go near mom. Don't go near mom. Eggshells. <laughs> right around her. Right? Shh. If only you would get in here. Now, my mom taught me this. She taught me this later. She said, it's how you say it. Just ask him. He doesn't, he will not understand unless you go into him and tell him nicely. And she wasn't talking about my husband. Because I tried to talk to his mom about him. I heard one time, side tip, if you have a hard time with your husband, talk to his mom. Because he, she knows him so well, your mom, it will just paint him in a bad picture. Now, I don't go talk to his mom all the time. Believe you me, that would just be terrible. But maybe once every five years, I'll say, you know, I'm really struggling with this one thing that he does. And she'll be like, oh, I know, honey. <laughs> she's, she's, she gets it, right? And my mom would be like, oh, uh, well, um, anyway. So I had to learn, my mom taught me this, that she learned with my dad, just say it nicely. 
Just say it nicely. You could tell him, I need a thousand dollars. I need to pay this bill. We're we're late. The, the bank is coming tomorrow. But as long as you say it nicely, they'll fork over the thousand dollars. Almost, right? It's how you say it. How do you say what you say? And so if you storm into his football room and you say, You promised to get in the kitchen and you promised to carve the turkey. So guess what happens? Walls. Yep. Immediately. He's just he just shuts down. He's he's just like shocked that you're acting this way. He's just enjoying the nice football game. What's wrong with the lady in the kitchen? Oh. He, he said he would, right? He said he would do it. He's not doing it. So I, did, I, I have had to learn to say, honey, yeah. The kids are now running through the basement and it's one o'clock and I, I think you said you, you would put them to bed. And I don't think they're in bed. In fact, I hear them screaming downstairs. And the neighbors are knocking on the door saying, what's the screaming? Yeah. Do you think that you could put them in bed? And let me tell you, that fake smile, that doesn't go anymore. And he knows now, the fake smile. The other day, we were coming here and I had to print off my thing. And he was, he was going around, bless his heart, and he was turning off all the devices. You know how you can save electricity if you turn off devices? So I run down there. I have about five minutes before we have to go. And I push the computer button. I know, I like, as the night before, I had turned it off, so I know I have to turn it on. Nothing happens. I'm like, oh, great. Because we have, like, spotty reception where we are. So I push the button again. I'm like, okay, we have five minutes. I just have to print this off. Just print this off. So nothing happens. I'm like, oh, no. This is going to be terrible because I didn't save it to a jump drive, yada, yada, yada. So then I start looking at the cord. I'm like, okay, the cord's connected to the wall. What is wrong with our computer? And then I think of my kids. Did my kids come down and unplug it? And then it hits me. Did somebody just turn the, um, you know, you plug it into that. The strip. Power yeah. Strip, the power strip. Power strip. I look down. And I can't even tell. I never know if the zero means on or off. Yes. So I just, I just flip the power switch button. And I push the computer one more time. Meanwhile, I was saying, who turned off the computer? Right? I really was. I was saying, who turned off the computer? Who turned off the computer? No one's answering. No one's answering. I don't know where they were. And I push the button, and it comes on. So then I went to the end of the stairs, and I heard somebody in the kitchen. I said, Dave? I said, did you turn off the computer? He says, well, I was just going around unplugging things. <laughs> right. So when he came down, I says, don't ever turn off my computer. And I said, so smiley. I thought I was like, going to get, I really thought he was going to be proud of me. Honestly. I don't ever turn off my computer before we go on a trip. <laughs> and he's like, you're angry. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was really hard, and but we didn't talk about it, we didn't finish that conversation because we had to get in the car, right? So I got my thing, got in the car, we dropped off the kids at Grandma's, and then we finally got on the road to the airport, and I said, should we talk about it? <laughs> and we talked about it, and he could tell I was angry, so I said, I'm sorry, I was angry, I'm sorry. I, I really tried to be even in my tone, you know what I mean? Like, you know, you're not screaming, so you think, that's okay, but my, and so my tone was right. But he could tell the seething underneath. <laughs> anyway, I didn't even mean to share that, so please don't go up to him and say, Did you turn off her computer? <laughs> I think he did learn his lesson. I mean, and I don't mean that in a bad way. He didn't, he didn't need to learn a lesson, but he needed to not touch the computer. <laughs> our words and our words will be come out in our tone yeah. and in our timing is it the right time to say this to him when they're starving and they're coming home from work is that the right time to tell him yeah. my mom said make sure he has a full stomach before you tell him <laughs> anything and that does help when i practice loving thoughts i have learned the more it becomes second nature to say softer kinder words so respect is a choice we make out of love for Christ. Sometimes does he deserve it? You know, sometimes maybe your husband, I don't, I don't know. Some, we don't know. But we say, Jesus, this is for you. I'm going to do this for you. And I do want to note here that I understand that there are circumstances sometimes where behavior by a husband is completely out of line. I'm not talking about that. Do you understand what I'm saying? There are times when it's not the time to reverence. It's time to get to safety. 
that would be an entirely different scenario than what we're talking about today. Someone asked, how do I know if I've crossed the disrespect line? One author noted, check for anger. If a man cannot articulate his feelings in the heat of the moment, he won't necessarily blurt out something like, you're disrespecting me. But rest assured, the author said, if he's angry at something you've said or done and you don't understand the cause, there's a good chance that he's feeling the pain or humiliation of your disrespect. I, I, I think we don't realize the power we have with our husbands. I really don't think that. I, I think Brother Jenkins' illustration yesterday will stick with me forever about the girl who said no when he was in junior high and how it devastated him until he was, whatever, 30 or so. We don't know what our... We think of them as formidable, strong, capable of doing anything men. And yet they're just really little... I don't mean this in a weird way, but they're just kids inside, right? And we have to we have to treat them with kid gloves in a, in a nice way. Not in a, I don't mean that in a weird way. They're obviously an adult, and they obviously provide for us, and, and they can't take go to work, and they do their job. But our words can tear down, and we want to build them up. He only gets one wife, most likely. <laughs> Sometimes you know something happens, and you pass on and he gets a second chance. But most of the time, it's you. You get to be his encourager. Somebody said this, when you got married, you thought you were wearing a beautiful, modest, white gown. But it really was a cheerleading outfit. Your job is to cheer for your husband and, and, and encourage him and edify him. Now there's all the things that he's supposed to do and hopefully they're learning upstairs, right? But we can encourage. We can build up our husband. We can. I'm sure all of us want to be good wives, and I'm sure we're all committed to doing our very best in the area. In this area, for me, it helps me to put a reminder on my prayer list to respect and cherish, and then His name. And you know what I do? I put it on my phone app, my to-do list on my phone. I actually put it every day. I have a reminder: respect and cherish. Some of us are like to-do list people, and we like to check things off. I put it on my to-do list. I want to honor the Lord in this area. The Lord promises to help those who will ask for help. James 4, 8, draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to you. James 4, 6, though, God resists the proud. He doesn't deserve it. That's not the attitude we should have. We should say, God, help me, help me. I have the power to influence this man and this home. God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. Have you ever thought about what you think about? What do you think about God? Is it accurate? He is good. He does love you. What do you think about yourself? Is it biblical? What comes to your mind when you think of your husband? Think truth. Replace wrong thoughts with right thoughts. Think God's word. Do you have God's word throughout your house? So you can think it? By my kitchen, I have a verse. On the piano, I have a verse. Do you have God's word throughout your home? And then thirdly, track your thoughts. You say, oh, my emotions are so volatile, and today I'm sad, yesterday I was depressed, and tomorrow I hope to be happy, right? That's your emotions. Track your thinking, how you're thinking. Everything's doom and gloom. The sun's not out. It's not supposed to be out for four days. It's just terrible. All the kids are sick. Track your thoughts. What are you thinking? Write it down, actually. We flew into Buffalo on Thursday night. Every airport that I've ever been to, including this one, has a control tower. Someone compared our thoughts to the control tower of our life. All our responses to what happens in our lives starts there, in your control tower. There was a mother of six children. She walked into her house one day to see all her children huddled together in a circle. She approached them to see what had evoked such intense interest, and she could hardly believe her eyes. To her horror, in the middle of the circle of children were several baby skunks. She immediately screamed at the top of her voice, children, run, 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 out, out, out. At the sound of their mother's alarmed voice, each child quickly grabbed a baby skunk and headed for the door. <laughs> the screaming and panic, of course, set off the instinctual danger alarm in the skunks, and each of them quickly dispelled its horrible scent. Each child and the house itself were dressed with an aroma that lingered for weeks, regardless of intense scrubbing. How we react to a negative situation often has greater consequences than the initial situation we encounter. Our reactions will be based on what we are thinking. What are you thinking about? 
How do you think about God? How do you think about yourself? How do you think about your husband? Do we need God? We need God's help with this. We really do. And you say, Jesus, change me. Every morning, change me. Make me more like you. I can't do it. I can't do this. I can't be the wife I'm supposed to be. I can't be the mother I'm supposed to be. I can't be the church lady I'm supposed to be. I need you every morning. Lord, help me. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for the power of your word. You teach us that as a lady thinks, so is she. As I think, I will be. If I think biblically, I will be biblical. If I think spiritual, I will be spiritual. If I think carnally, if I think angrily, critically, negatively, I will be critical, carnal, negative. We can't do this, Jesus. So we empty us of ourselves, and we ask you to fill us and help us, and we will mess up, and we will say we're sorry, and we'll get up and try again. And we'll mess up, and we'll say we're sorry, and we'll get up and try again. But every day we get one step closer to being like you, and taking time to be holy like we heard some about. Moment by moment, each step of the way, I'm just going to quiet down here for a minute. Is there anything you want to talk to Jesus about? Is there something that you need to say, God, help me with this? Or please forgive me for this. I know I have to ask him every day, all day, for strength and help. Dear God, you are real. And you know each lady. And you know her struggles her home, and her husband. But you have the power. All power is given unto me in heaven and earth, you said. And you have given us that power in the indwelling Holy Spirit. And I pray that you will change us because of your word and your spirit. Giving us the grace, the enabling power to do what you want me to do. Thank you, Jesus. We love you so much. We thank you for this church. We thank you for the Constantinos. Thank you for this conference. We pray that you'll be with us. Bless the lunch that's to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Father.